Um, and now we can introduce our, uh, our main speaker for the first night, uh, Mr. Christopher West, a friend of mine, and who's spoken at many of the conferences, is a renowned educator, best-selling author, a cultural commentator, and popular theologian who specializes in making the dense scholarship of blessed John Paul II's Theology of the Body accessible to a wide audience. West has been teaching graduate and undergraduate courses on the Theology of the Body and Sexual Ethics since the late 1990s, having served on the faculty of St. John Vianney Theological Seminary in Denver, the Institute for Priestly Formation at Creighton University in Omaha, and as a visiting professor at the John Paul Institute in Melbourne, Australia. Since 2004, he has served as a research fellow and faculty member of the Theology of the Body Institute near Philadelphia. His courses there continue to draw clergy, religious, and lay people from around the globe. Of all of his titles and accomplishments, Christopher is most proud to call himself a devoted husband and father. His uh, talk today is The Triumph of the Immaculate Heart, Theology of the Body, and Our Lady of Fatima. So welcome, Christopher. I'm going to sit over there. Can you hear me now? Should I start over? Could you hear me? What a joy to kick us off on this fourth, yes, Pete? Fourth International Symposium on the Theology of the Body. My hope tonight is that I will shine a light on the significance of having this symposium here in Fatima. I'm sure it didn't escape many of you Today's date, June the 13th. Remember John Paul II saying, reflecting on the events of his own assassination attempt and the date, May 13th, 1981, there are no mere coincidences in the plan of God. This number 13, very, very significant. Of course, we all know, I'll be talking about this at some length tonight, May 13th, 1981, the assassination attempt. May 13, 2000, John Paul II beatified Francesco and Jacinta. June 13, 2003, Ali Akka, the Pope's would-be assassin, was extradited to Turkey. February 13, 2005, Sister Lucia dies. April 2, 2005, do the math, 422005 adds up to 13, and that is the day John Paul II died. He died 37 minutes past the 21st hour. Do the math. 13. I'm just saying. <laughs> May 13th, 2005, our beloved Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI began the canonization process of our beloved, late and now blessed, Pope John Paul II. So all those 13s. But let me take you back, let me take you back now to May 12th, 1981, the day before the fateful assassination attempt. That night, in evening prayer, John Paul II was praying compline. I'm getting these facts, by the way, from George Weigel, who does an excellent accounting of the details. And we discover that that night in compline, John Paul II read this from 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour someone. These were prescient words. Let's go to the next day. John Paul II was having lunch, lunch with a good friend of his, 
an international pro-life leader and geneticist, Jerome Lejeune. That day, May 13th, 1981, the Communist Party in Rome was planning a very extensive demonstration promoting abortion rights. Five o'clock, John Paul II gets in the Pope Mobile, as he typically does on Wednesdays, drives out into St. Peter's Square. And at about five, one account says 513, another 517, but somewhere around that time, a strange phenomenon occurred. Hundreds of pigeons suddenly just took flight, a kind of panicked flight into the air. And because of the strange acoustics in St. Peter's, George Weigel reports, that's what people saw first. It was a delayed reaction, and then fractions of a second later, they heard the gunshots. This is the report from Stanislaw Jivish, who caught the Holy Father when he fell from the bullets. The instant the Pope was shot, an invisible power came into action making it possible to save the life of the Holy Father who was in mortal danger. There was no time to think. There was no doctor within reach. A single erroneous decision could have had catastrophic effects. Ali Aka fired at point-blank range. He was a trained assass assassin, and he shot to kill. Does anybody know how Ali Akka was captured? By a nun who tackled him. <laughs> Guess what her name was? Lucia. What would have been typically a 25-minute ride to the hospital, the ambulance made it in about eight minutes. Thanks be to God. Again from now Cardinal Jeevish, he says, The main surgeon confided to me later that he had not been on duty that day. This is the surgeon who saved the Holy Father's life. He had not been on duty that day, but a mysterious force had impelled him to go to the hospital. And driving in his car on the way to the hospital following this mysterious force, he heard on the radio the news that the Holy Father had been shot. And he knew why he was on the way to the hospital. When he arrived at the hospital, George Weigel reports, someone was thinking ahead and all the elevators had been brought down to the first level so that there would no, be no delay. He was brought up to the emergency room or to the operating room, was scrubbed up very quickly, dressed for surgery, and made an incision from the top of the Holy Father's sternum the whole way down to his pelvis. And when he opened his abdomen, this, these are his words, there was blood everywhere. The Holy Father had a perforated colon. There were five lesions in his small intestine. 22 inches of his intestine was removed. And the Holy Father, for the rest of his life, he had to eat very differently. He had to have very small portions, and he had to spread his meals out throughout the day. He had to eat many meals in a day, very small portions. Very interesting. I never knew that until doing research for this presentation. The bullet that pierced his abdomen missed his abdominal artery by a hair. Had it hit that artery, he would have certainly bled to death in the Pope Mobile. It also narrowly missed vital organs such as the liver and the spleen. It narrowly missed his spinal column, which could have paralyzed him. And every major nerve cluster was missed. These are John Paul II's personal reflections. He says, this was from his book, Memory and Identity, by the way, which I highly recommend you read. One of his 
last publications, his Holy Father, came out in 2005. He says, Akka knew how to shoot, and he certainly shot to kill. Yet it was as if some mysterious hand was guiding the bullet. That mysterious hand, John Paul II believed, was the hand of the woman of Fatima. He himself says, Could I forget that the event in St. Peter's Square took place on the day and at the hour when the first appearance of the Mother of Christ had been remembered at Fatima in Portugal? For in everything that happened to me on that very day, I felt the extraordinary motherly protection and care, which turned out to be stronger than the deadly bullet. Mary's motherly protection and care turned out to be stronger than the deadly bullet. Thanks be to God. We would not be gathered here today reflecting on this catechesis. We would only have a small portion of of the catechesis had the Holy Father died that day. Again, these are the Holy Father's own words. He says, around Christmas 1983, I visited my attacker in prison. We spoke at length. In the course of our conversation, it became clear that he was still wondering how the attempted assassination could possibly have failed. Think about it. He is a trained assassin. He knew what he was doing. Everything was planned meticulously. He shot to kill at point blank range, and he's alive. How, how, does this, how does this work? The Holy Father himself says he had planned it meticulously, attended to every tiny detail, and yet his intended victim had escaped death. How could this have happened? That's what Ali Agka wanted to know. When John Paul II met with him in prison, how is it that you are still alive? The interesting thing, John Paul II says, is that his perplexity had led him to the religious question. He wanted to know about the secret of Fatima. Remember, the third secret of Fatima was not released until 2000. This is in 1983. He wanted to know about the secret of Fatima, what the secret actually was. This was his principal concern. More than anything else, he wanted to know this. What is the secret of Fatima? Perhaps those insistent questions showed that he had grasped something really important, the Holy Father reflects. Ali Akka had probably sensed that over and above his own power, over and above the power of violence, of shooting, of killing, there was a higher power. And the Holy Father says he began to look for it. And he concludes, I hope and pray that he found it. The secrets of Fatima, to us, probably not secrets. But for many, many years, the church knew the two secrets of Fatima, but the third was sealed in an envelope in the archives at the Vatican. I believe, if I have my facts correct, that Pope John XXIII read the third secret uh, and returned it to the archives and decided not to make it public. I believe also, if I have my facts correct, Paul VI read the secret but decided not to make it public and returned the envelope to the archives at the Vatican. After recovering from being shot in St. Peter's Square, one of John Paul II's first requests of his secretary, Stanislaw Jivish, was please go get that envelope. And John Paul II read what we now know to be a prophecy of a bishop dressed in white who was gunned down. Now, the first secret of Fatima, Sister Lucia, a young girl at the time, Jacinta and Francesco, when the 
Blessed Mother appeared to them, they saw visions of hell. This horrifying vision, which was a call to reparation, not meant to just strike terror in these little children, but to demonstrate really and truly what is at stake when we close our hearts to the love of God and to inspire in these little ones a call to make reparation, to repair, to, to pray, to above all, to pray for the world. The second secret involved a prophecy of the Second World War, and it contained this warning. Russia will spread her errors around the world. Now, these little children didn't even know what Russia was. Uh, they thought that the Blessed Mother might be referring to their uncle's donkey, who was named something like Russa or, or Russ or something. <laughs> so they have no idea about world politics or world... They don't know Russia's a country. They don't know what these errors of Russia are. Uh, who knows what they might have thought the error of their uncle's donkey might have been. <laughs> but this is what they heard. Russia will spread her errors around the world. I remember as a young boy, whenever we would go to my grandparents' house, my mother's parents, for dinner, my grandfather would say the grace, and he always concluded, it just sounded like a bunch of syllabus, syllables to me. I didn't even know what he was saying, but Our Lady of Fatima, I pray for Russia. <laughs> That's just something my grandfather said at the end of, of grace, you know, before meals. Our Lady of Fatima, I pray for Russia. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for Russia. She also told the children, the Holy Father will suffer much, but in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And this is primarily what my presentation is about tonight. What does the theology of the body have to do with these promises? And particularly with the promise, in the end, my immaculate heart will Will triumph. Now, interestingly, in the third secret revealed in 2000, the vision was that this bishop dressed in white fell dead. Cardinal Ratzinger, in his commentary on the third secret of Fatima, says this The fact that John Paul II's life was spared only shows once more that there is no immutable destiny that faith and prayer are forces that can influence history. Let me say that again. Faith and prayer are forces that can influence history. How many of you remember May 13th, 1981? I do. I do very well. I was in fifth grade in Catholic school, I had come home, and I was listening to the radio, and I heard the news, and I remember shouting down the steps to my mother, Mom, the Pope's been shot! And as an American, uh, this was, the stunningness of this announcement was compounded by the fact that President Reagan had just been shot a few weeks earlier. And I also remember watching the evening news, and I remember the whole world gathered in prayer for the Holy Father. And we can say with confidence, the whole world that night gathered in prayer changed history. We would not be gathered here today if it weren't for the power of those prayers. I think we can say that with, with utmost confidence. Cardinal Ratzinger goes on. Faith and prayer are forces that can influence history. And the fact that John Paul II didn't die indicates that in the end, prayer is more powerful than bullets. Did you hear that one? Prayer is more powerful than bullets, and faith is more powerful than armies. Wow. Should give us hope. Now, a few things you may not know about May 13th, 1981. John Paul II, just the prior Wednesday, May 6th, 1981, had finished his reflections on historical man, 
chapter number two or cycle number two of his reflections on the theology of the body. He had just wrapped up his reflection on purity of heart. On how else might we describe it? Having an immaculate heart. That's what purity means, without stain. That's what immaculate means, without stain. He had just finished his reflections on what it means to have an immaculate heart. And he finished this with a specific critique of pornography. So we can assume, although Weigel reports that on May 13th, the Holy Father was beginning a new series of Wednesday audiences. He was putting the theology of the body temporarily on hold in order to inaugurate a series on the 90th anniversary of Rerum Novarum. Uh, nonetheless, I find this very significant that the catechesis was interrupted by these gunshots. Also, on May 13, 1981, driving into St. Peter's Square, the Holy Father had planned to announce the founding of what would become, number one, his theological arm for spreading this theology of the body around the world, the Pontifical Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family, of which I am a proud graduate, and his pastoral arm for spreading this theology of the body around the world, the Pontifical Council for the Family. Both of these were to be announced that day. Before he could make these announcements, before he could establish these two arms to spread the theology of the body around the world, boom, boom, shot dead. Not dead, thanks be to God. Shot down. But of course, the intention was to be shot dead. Can we not conclude from these just historical facts can we not surmise there were forces at work that did not want this theology of the body to spread around the world? How many of you are involved in some active way in spreading this theology of the body around the world? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you would say this is easy work? How many of you would say you have felt that there are forces at work that do not want you to be doing this? How many of you would say that you have felt in your own particular way bullets aimed at you, meant to bring you down? How many of you can also attest to this mysterious hand that seems time after time to save you? Mary's doing something with the spread of this theology of the body. And I am personally convinced it has to do with what she promised in Fatima. In the end, purity of heart will triumph. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. When the Holy Father recovered from the assassination attempt, he finally did establish the John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family and the Pontifical Council for the Family. And it was October 7th, 1982, that he established his Theological Institute, which happened to be the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. And he put this Pontifical Institute specifically, by name, under the protection of Our Lady of Fatima, himself making the connection that the Blessed Mother saved his life in part so that this message could get around the world. So let's go back to that word from the Blessed Mother, which I think holds an important clue for us in understanding the connection between the messages of Fatima and the theology of the body. Russia will spread her errors around the world. Now we rightly think here of the spread of communism and of the theory behind it, Marxist economic theory, and we are correct to do so. But underlying Marxist economic theory, which led to communism, which was obviously the, the most forthright and ob uh, obvious and 
by all indications, that's the error of Russia. We are right to conclude it. We have to go deeper, I suggest, to find why this theology of the body is the true antidote to the errors of Russia. And here I thank Father Walter Shue and his book, The Splendor of Love, where I, I learned some of these very important insights. We all have learned, I'm sure, growing up in school and understanding history that Marx considered class struggle to be the defining factor of history. What we may not know is that Marx believed that the fundamental class struggle is found in monogamous marriage and the sexual difference itself. The division of labor, the first division of labor, Marx co-wrote with Frederick Engels, is that between man and woman for the propagation of children. As Engels affirmed, Marxist theory demands the abolition of the monogamous family as the economic unit of society. Let me say that again. The first division of labor, this was co-written by Marx and Frederick Engels, is that between man and woman for the propagation of children. And then this is a quote from Engels. Marxist theory demands the abolition of the monogamous family as the economic unit of society. Now, as an American, we tend to think, as Americans, that we avoided those errors of Russia because communism never took us over. But if we understand the deeper errors of Russia are found right here in this fundamental anthropological error, which is the leveling of the sexual difference, we in America have swallowed this error of Russia hook, line, and sinker. And I would submit for your prayerful reflection that this is the deeper and more fundamental error of Russia that has spread and continues to spread almost unabated around the world. Feminist author Shulamith Firestone, in her book, The Dialectic of Sex, writes this. Just as the end goal of socialist revolution was the elimination of the economic class distinction itself, so the end goal of the feminist revolution, and here we know there's a Christian sense of feminism, but we're talking here, she's talking, this radical feminist agenda, she says, the end goal of the feminist revolution must be the elimination of the sex distinction itself so that genital differences between human beings would no longer matter culturally. An acquaintance of mine, years ago I saw him giving a lecture and he spoke about a professor he had in Germany whose main question in life was this, and it must be ours. Why are there two sexes? Why are there two sexes? This is one of, if not the, fundamental question addressed in John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Now, he does say, the Holy Father says, that the mystery of the human body is deeper than the sexual difference itself. When Adam beheld Eve in the garden, it wasn't even first that he recognized a woman. It was first that he recognized another body like himself. It was first a recognition of the common humanity they share. And yet we cannot and must not extract our bodiliness, the Holy Father says, from the sexual difference. We cannot understand bodiliness apart from the sexual difference. And so the Holy Father says in his catechesis on Genesis that the sexual difference is not merely an attribute 
of the human person. But it is constitutive of the human person. I think sometimes because coming to terms with our sexuality is fraught with so much trial and difficulty and pain and suffering, we can fall in a quasi-Manichaean direction. We can lean in a quasi-Manichaean direction by, by sectioning off our sexuality as something about our humanity that's over there. A, a footnote. If there's anything we learn in the Holy Father's catechesis, it's that we cannot understand our humanity unless we come to terms with our creation as male and female. Christ's own words indicate as much. Have you not read that in the beginning he made them male and female and called the two to become one flesh? But here's what I have discovered in my own journey, which, as we all know, the journey of following Christ is a journey of ongoing purification. We never arrive in this life. And in my own journey of ongoing purification, there is a, a deeper and deeper confrontation in my own broken humanity with my tendency and temptation to want to reject my body and my sexuality. Why? Here's what I've discovered in my own journey. It is easier to eschew the body. It is easier to reject the body. It is easier to consign our sexuality to a footnote than it is to face the brokenness and woundedness in our hearts that cause us to want to reject our bodies and our sexuality. That's hard work. That takes deep in interior reflection. As John Paul II says, this is a science. We must become deep interior men and women. Men and women with a deep knowledge of our interior life. Because it is deep in the heart, he says, that we discover the meaning of our sexuality, the meaning of our creation as male and female. Why are there two sexes? What we learn in scripture is this, there are two sexes precisely to be a sign here on planet earth of the mystery that has been hidden in God for eternity. There are two sexes and the two are called to become one flesh precisely to be a sign of the great mystery of Christ's love for the church. And so every attack on the sexual difference, every attack on the meaning of marriage, Every attack on the meaning of human sexuality is ultimately an attack on the mystery of Christ and his love for the church. John Paul II said in his letter to families that the mystery of the love of man and woman, the two called to become one flesh, and the family that springs from that union brings us to the center of the great struggle between good and evil, between life and death, between love and everything that is opposed to love. In the section of the catechesis where the Holy Father is reflecting on the marriage of Tobias and Sarah, he says that when husband and wife become one flesh, they find themselves in the situation in which the powers of good and evil fight against each other. And just as there was a demon that had its sights set on destruction of the marriages of Sarah, seven men, right? Seven men she had been married to. Each one died in the bridal chamber before they could consummate the union. There is a demon who wants to write into God's plan of love and life this demon wants to write lust and death. Now put yourself in the shoes of Tobias. <laughs> Guys, imagine you're Tobias. An angel comes to you and says, I want you to marry Sarah. John Paul II, man of great wisdom that he is, reflects. Tobias had reason to be afraid. <laughs> 
Indeed, on the day of the wedding, Sarah's father is out digging his grave. (laughs) And the whole point, I believe, of the Holy Father reflecting on the marriage of Tobias and Sarah in the Catechesis on the Theology of the Body is to make it very plain to us that we are involved in a fierce battle, a spiritual battle. And the only way to overcome, the only way to conquer, is the way Tobias and Sarah conquered. Prayer. Or in the language of the Holy Father, conjugal love must become liturgical. In other words, the love of man and woman must be lived as it truly is. A great sign, a great sacrament of the mystery of Christ's love for the church. That is what we celebrate in liturgy. We celebrate the spousal love of Christ for the church. And this is what man and woman are called to enter every time they become one flesh. Tobias and Sarah enter the bridal chamber. And before they consummate their union, they pray. And what do they pray? They pray about God's original plan for man and woman before sin distorted it. And they cry out for God's mercy to live it. And Tobias says, I do not take this sister of mine for lustful motive, but with sincerity of heart. Tobias himself contrasts the sincere gift of self with the distortion of lust. And we know he wants to give his whole life to this woman because he prays, Lord, let me spend a wealth of days with her. Let me have a happy life with her. Let me live with her for the rest of my days. And together they say, this is the key point, together they say, amen. This is what they desire with their whole heart. But that key line, John Paul II says, is when Tobias says, I do not take her for lustful motive. He says, this is the moment of purification John Paul says, this is the moment of the full purification to which we are all called. This is the prayer, if we pray it, by which we become immaculate. In this life, not so lucky. The journey goes on and on and on. But we have as our model the saints who have gone before us, who step by step, journeying with the Lord, become more and more immaculate. Why are there two sexes? Precisely to reveal the great mystery of Christ's love for the church. Now let's see if we can connect some dots. The communist system seemed invincible. And it looked as if it were going to endure for centuries. Lech Valenza says this. This was on an interview I saw on the Discovery Channel in 2005. He says, for 20 years, I could only find 10 people who wanted to fight the communist regime from a nation of 40 million. Nobody, I repeat, nobody thought that communism would end. Then, within a year, of John Paul II's visit to Poland in 1979, in one year, he emphasizes, it went from 10 people to a movement of 10 million. In one year! How? Why? What is going on here? What did John Paul II do in 1979 when he returned to Poland as Pope? He simply proclaimed to his people who they really are. He told them their true dignity. And having been oppressed for so long by so many lies, lie after lie after lie propagated by a well-oiled communist machine spreading propaganda that were lies about what it meant to be human, having been oppressed by these lies when These hearts that had been oppressed heard this truth. They caught on fire. And that fire spread from heart to heart to heart to begin a revolution that caused the collapse of the communist regime that everyone thought would be around for centuries. 
Similarly, today, we are being oppressed by this deeper error of Russia that the sexual difference is meaningless. We have been lied to over and over and over by a well-oiled machine spreading propaganda that is lying to us about the meaning of our humanity, about the meaning of our bodies, about the meaning of our sexuality, about the meaning of marriage, about the meaning of the family. We are being lied to. And we are oppressed by these lies, whether we know it or not. I would venture to say most of us in this room, we know we're being oppressed by these lies. But there's a whole world out there that seems not to know that we're being oppressed by these lies. Seems to think this is the path to liberation and freedom, just like so many people thought that communism was a, was a path to liberation and freedom. But similarly, just as John Paul II in 1979 proclaimed the true dignity of the human being to the Poles, I have a theory. I have not confirmed this. I tried to when Mikhail Waldstein and I traveled to uh, Krakow in when was it, 2008, we were able to meet with Cardinal Jivish and ask him a few questions, and I forgot to ask him this one. Your Excellency, maybe you could get this question to Cardinal Jivish. But I have a theory that John Paul II didn't begin the catechesis on the theology of the body until September of 1979, remember his visit to Poland is June of 79, because he didn't have the manuscript with him. And that he picked up, my theory, that he picked up the manuscript in Poland when he was there. And he came back from Poland and started sharing with the whole world essentially the same message he had shared with his countrymen. Who are you? But he's now going to the deeper error of Russia, which is the attack on the sexual difference itself. Interestingly, just as communism collapsed, relatively speaking, very rapidly, I think we can draw this parallel. I believe this false ideology of what it means to be human that attacks our sexuality, that attacks marriage, that attacks the family, I believe as this revolution is underway from heart to heart, as this fire spreads, just as it did in Poland, that this system will collapse rapidly. And I think we get a hint of it in the book of Revelation. There are these two great feminine figures in the book of Revelation, the bride of Christ and the whore of Babylon. And the whore of Babylon is the mockery of the bride of Christ. We have to keep this in mind. This is all the devil can do is mock what is true, good, and beautiful. Why? Because the devil doesn't have his own clay. That's why. If we give the devil his own clay, if in our own mentality we think the devil has his own clay, guess what we are? We are Manichaean. Manichaeism is a system of thought, John Paul II says in his catechesis, that assigns to evil an ontological isness. Evil does not have isness. It does not have an ontological existence. Evil is only the twisting, distortion, or absence of the good. That's what I mean when I say the devil doesn't have his own clay. That's all he can do is take God's clay, and God looked at everything he made and said, Behold, it is very good. All the devil can do is take God's very good clay and twist it up. And the redemption of the body is not the rejection of the body, it's the untwisting of all the distortions of the body. And oh, is the devil a cunning plagiarizer. Oh, is the enemy a cunning uh, mock artist, counterfeiter. How do we recognize the difference? If he's so cunning in his counterfeits, how do we recognize the difference? The bride in the book of Revelation is extremely attractive. She's beautiful. She's radiant. The adulterous harlot Babylon is also very attractive, but she leads the world astray. How do we recognize the difference between the two? John Paul II, in an address called The Church, A Bride Adorned for Her Husband, gives us the main difference and the key to distinguish 
the mockery of the bride from the true bride. And he says it is this. The bride of Christ is endowed with inner fruitfulness and is constantly bringing forth children of God. As we read in the book of Revelation, she is dressed in fine linen. She is bright and immaculate. She is clothed with the sun and she is pregnant. Whereas the whore of Babylon embodies, John Paul II says, death and inner barrenness. She chooses barrenness as if it were good. Is this ringing any bells? Is this turning on any light bulbs for you as to what's going on in our world? Pete, I thank you for pointing out to me that Paul VI, soon after the majority report of the Papal Birth Control Commission was released in 1967, Paul VI, feeling the weight of what was going on, feeling what was against him, he traveled to Fatima. And on May 13th, ding, 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 1967, he prayed here in Fatima for the church, specifically against new ideologies that were threatening the church by introducing a profane mentality and worldly morals. What is contraception if not a direct frontal attack on the very essence of the sexual difference? Contraception in rendering the sex act sterile renders the sexual difference null and void. And so it is impossible, and we must underscore this, and we must realize it deep in our bones, this fundamental truth. It is impossible to resist the homosexual propaganda, the homosexual plan, when we've bought its basic premise by swallowing the pill. The basic premise is this. Sexual pleasure divorced from fertility. As soon as you sever sexual pleasure from procreation, any means to sexual pleasure is now fair game. All that is going on in the culture today circles back to humani vitae. And why did John Paul II give us the theology of the body? Precisely to help us understand the deep roots, the deep anthropological and biblical roots of humane vitae. In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And this is to say, in the end, purity of heart will triumph. This is good news. This is very good news. This is, again, from Ratzinger's commentary on the third secret. According to Matthew 5, 8, one of the key texts of the theology of the body, about purity of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. According to Matthew 5, 8, the immaculate heart, or the pure heart, is a heart which, with God's grace, has come to perfect interior unity and therefore sees God. To be devoted to the immaculate heart of Mary means, therefore, to embrace purity of heart. And how do we do this? As Mary did, by giving our fiat, Ratzinger says, your will be done, and making this fiat the defining center of our whole life. What is purity of heart? John Paul II tells us, purity of heart is the ability to see the mystery of God revealed through the human body. It is the untwisting of all of those distortions of the great harlot 
Babylon so that we can see with our eyes the glory, the beauty, the splendor of the bride, the immaculate bride. Purity of heart, John Paul says, is the glory of the human body before God. That's purity. Purity is the glory of the human body before God. It is the glory of God in the human body. It is the glory of God in the human body. Of whom, more than Mary Immaculate, can we say the glory of God was in her body. The glory of God was in her body. Her body, woman's body, gives God flesh. It is woman's body. It is woman's womb that brings Christ to the world. Woman is the touch point, therefore, between heaven and earth. Because in her womb, heaven comes to earth. And this is why the attack is from the beginning. There's nothing new under the sun. The attack is aimed at woman. The devil's enmity from the beginning has been aimed at woman and her ability to bear offspring. It's right in Genesis chapter 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. There it is, the battle, the tension, the friction. All the vile hatred of the enemy is always aimed at the woman and her ability to bear offspring. What does the dragon want to do in Revelation chapter 12 before the pregnant woman? He wants to devour her child. There's nothing new under the sun. The devil always plays this card. And if we have spiritual eyes to see what abortion is, we can see it right there in Revelation 12. The enemy wants to devour woman's children. He wants to turn the womb, a place of life, into a tomb, a place of death. But what is the good news of the gospel? Here it is in a nutshell. Here's the good news of the theology of the body in a nutshell. Christ has turned the tomb the place of death, back into a womb, a place of life. This is our hope. What does the triumph of the Immaculate Heart mean? Asked Cardinal Ratzinger in his commentary on the third secret. The heart open to God, purified by contemplation of God. This heart, what heart? The heart open to God, the heart purified by contemplation of God, that heart is stronger than guns and weapons of every kind. But how do we open our hearts? How do we open our hearts? Is this on? When I walked in here this afternoon and saw this work of art, I knew the Lord was whispering something to me. Because I usually show in my presentations uh, an image of this, uh, similar, very similar to this. And I did not get my act together quickly enough to send that ahead of time so that it could be on the screen. And I was lamenting this on the plane the whole way over here. I said, okay, Lord, this is going to be a key point of my talk. Please provide for me. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. How is the heart of the bride open to the heart of the bridegroom? We see it beautifully right here, and I'll close on this reflection. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that she might be holy and immaculate. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. For what reason? To reveal, proclaim, and foreshadow through the mystery of the sacrament the love of Christ for the church. And this is what is so beautifully depicted here. John Paul II says this passage in Ephesians chapter 5 where St. Paul links the one flesh union with the love of Christ in the church. He says this passage is a compendium or summa in some way of the teaching about God and man revealed in Jesus Christ. 
John Paul II says this passage in which St. Paul links the one flesh union with the holy communion of Christ in the church, he says this passage in a very particular way reveals man to himself and makes his supreme calling clear. He says this passage is the central theme of the whole of Revelation. This passage contains the central theme, the whole of biblical revelation. This passage, above all, John Paul II, is what God the Father wishes to reveal to mankind through his word. Those are lines out of the catechesis. What does God want to reveal? He wants to marry us. This is why we have these yearnings. This is why we have these longings. This is why we have these desires for union, for love. We're looking for the marriage that lasts forever, and it's consummated here. I quote here from Bishop Fulton Sheen. Now, we've always thought, and rightly so, of Christ the Son on the cross and the mother beneath him. But that's not the complete picture. That's not the deeper understanding. Who is our Lord on the cross? He's the new Adam. And where's the new Eve? At the foot of the cross. If Eve, Eve became the mother of the living in the natural order, is not this woman at the foot of the cross to become another mother? And so the bridegroom looks down on his bride. I love this look. Look at that. That is just beautiful. beautiful. Can I kiss you? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Bless you. Bless you. Captured it. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. You've captured it. You've captured the look. What look? The look that brings the peace of the interior gaze. This is the peace of the interior gaze right here, captured beautifully in art. And that line comes from the Holy Father's reflections on Genesis. The peace of the interior gaze. When the first Adam and the first Eve, both of them immaculate, right? <laughs> this is before sin. How do we know they were immaculate? How do we know they were filled with holiness, John Paul says, in the beginning? Preach it. How, how do we know it? Shout it out. Because they were naked and felt no shame. He says this is the key. This is the key to understanding God's original plan for man and woman. They were naked and felt no shame. Why? Because they saw into the mystery of the body, the mystery of God revealed. That's what they saw. That's the peace of the interior gaze. And this is what the new Adam and the new Eve see when their marriage is mystically consummated. A virginal marriage mystically consummated through what St. Augustine calls the marriage bed of the cross. And so the bridegroom looks down at the bride. He looks at his beloved. Christ looks at his church. There is here the birth of the church. As St. Augustine puts it, and I assure you here I am quoting him verbatim. That's Fulton Sheen's words. The heavenly bridegroom left the heavenly chambers with the vision of the nuptials before him. He came to the marriage bed of the cross. A bed not of pleasure, but of pain. He united himself with the woman and consummated the union forever. As it were, the blood and water that came from the side of Christ was his spiritual seed. And the bride receives, beautifully depicted here, this artistic represent, and how do you artistically represent the consummation of a virginal mystical marriage? This is a beautiful depiction of the consummation of a virginal mystical marriage, a marriage of their hearts. What hearts? The sacred and immaculate hearts. This is our hope, my brothers and sisters. This is our hope. In 1854, In 1854, Pope Pius IX declared Mary as the Immaculate Conception. Guess when he was born? <laughs> May 13th, 1792. 
And what he gave us in 1854 was marriage as it was in the beginning. In the East, do you know how they depict the Immaculate Conception? I think in the West, when we hear Immaculate Conception, we think of Joachim's sperm reaching Anne's egg, and there's Mary. And that's, of course, that's part of it. But do you know how they depict it in the East? The icon is of a chaste embrace between Joachim and Anne, with the marriage bed behind them. How is it possible that their marital embrace led to the Immaculate Conception if their hearts had not also, in some way, been made profoundly pure? And so in 1854, in this sense, Pope Pius IX gave to us a vision of marriage as it was in the beginning. 1950, Pope Pius XII, guess when he was consecrated a bishop? May 13th, 1917, and he declared what? The Assumption, the Blessed Virgin. And what do we have here if not a vision of the marriage of the Lamb? When the bride is made ready for the bridegroom and she's led down the aisle, a bride adorned and ready for the bridegroom. That's the proclamation of the Assumption. What happened in between 1854 and in 1950, spread of communism. The Marxist theory was being developed in the mid-1800s. 1950, Hugh Hefner, 1953, Hugh Hefner started Playboy magazine. And it seems to me the whole pornographic revolution that has come as a result, when the assumption was declared in 1950, this is my image as I take these things to prayer, I see Mary with her heel on the head of the dragon, 1950. And the last 60 years has been the enemy's tail flailing in death throes. But in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph. December 8th, 1974. Who knows what that is? It's the date on page number one of the original manuscript of John Paul II's Theology of the Body, Feast of the Immaculate Conception, dedicated to Mary, all beautiful, dedicated to Mary Immaculate, Toda Pulchra S. Maria. Oh my goodness, we are part of something huge going on, mysterious, hard to figure out and don't even try because it's too big. But we get little glimpses, like sometimes the veil's just lifted a little bit. Oh my gosh, something big is going on. And let us remain small. Let us remain small. And something big will be accomplished. How do we fight this fight? The attack against marriage is an attack against Christ's love for the church. And if Marriage really is a sacramental mystery that reveals and proclaims to the world the eternal plan of God that Christ would be one with the church. Then it seems to me that marriage will go the way that Christ and the church went. It will be crucified. It will be mocked. It will be spat upon. It will be crowned with thorns and it will die. But it will rise and it will rise in glory. The third secret of Fatima was not only a vision of a bishop dressed in white who was gunned down. It also said there were priests, there were religious, and there were many lay people who in union and with the Holy Father were shot down. I close with this, an address that John Paul II gave in 1980. We have to be ready for impending tribulations, which may require the sacrifice of our lives and the gift of ourselves to and for Christ. The intensity of these trials can be diminished by our prayer, but they cannot be avoided because it is only through trials that true renewal can come. Let us be strong and let us make ready, trusting 
in Christ and his mother. In 1994, in Crossing the Threshold of Hope, John Paul II said, Mary's words spoken in Fatima seem to be close to their fulfillment. My brothers and sisters, we have caught this fire called Theology of the Body. We are on a journey, each and every one of us, out from under the oppression of these errors of Russia that have spread throughout the world. But as we take up this banner, willing even to die, willing even to die, as John Paul II says, willing to shed blood. And I, I, I honestly don't think that's an impossibility. I think it's on the horizon. John Paul II has already opened the way for us with the shedding of his blood. Perhaps we can imagine ourselves as followers of John Paul II with a chalice right at the bullet wounds, receiving his blood. If we drink deeply from this cup without fear, be not afraid. If we have the courage to drink deeply from this cup, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. All the ends of the earth shall see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. And this means all the ends of the earth shall see the glory of God revealed through the human body. May the word made flesh be praised now and ever and forever. Amen. Amen.